Please welcome Rabbi Susan Goldberg. I'm honored to be here today to share some words. And I'm even more honored that I had the opportunity to grow up around the incredible presence of Blaise Bompain and of you too, Teresa. And this triumvirate of couples, these former priests and nuns, the radical spirits of Blaise and Teresa and also of Phyllis and Bob Menard, and Rini and Larry Hahn, whose memory we lift up here too. What souls so full of loving, so full of justice. Getting to be around you in this community of soulful, radical warriors so grateful and representing so many of us from my generation who had the great honor of getting to be kids around these incredible human beings. There was a quality to your activism, a spiritual quality, spiritual all the time, as you said, Blaze that greatly affected my insides and turned out to shape the course of my life. Because certainly, coming from these crazy socialist parents, nobody expected me to become a rabbi. <laughs> but I just have to point to you and say, well, they were here, <laughs> and they shaped this journey. In November of 1989, six Jesuit priests were murdered in El Salvador along with their housekeeper and her 15-year-old daughter. My father, Art, brought me downtown to the action that was happening at the Federal Building. I think, I mean, it was a while ago, but I remember, I think we marched from La Placita to the Federal Building. And I remember seeing those poster size images of the priests who were murdered and the housekeeper and her daughter. And I kept looking at the image of her daughter, 15, just like I was. And I saw Blaze and Martin Sheen letting people know that we were gonna, that they were gonna sit in front of the doors, link arms and choose to not get up because it was the blood on our hands as Americans who were funding the death squads that had killed these people and so many others. And as we marched along, I looked up at my dad and I said, I'm going to sit down with Blaze and not get up at 15. And he said, OK. <laughs> A unique family. It was clear to me that that was the only choice on that day. The only choice to stay sane. The only choice to stay connected to the memory of this girl and to all those who had been murdered. The only way to honor their lives. And linking arms in front of that building and not moving There was this depth of soul and clarity that took away the fear. And I know many of you have had the experience of linking arms with Blaze and not getting up in this room. Many of you have done this. The only sane thing to do sometimes in these crazy times is to commit to the nonviolence that he so represented in his life of love. And the thing that struck me was that when we were down there in the basement of the federal building, he immediately used it as a meeting. <laughs> 
You would think we would be talking about what are we going to do to get out and this and that. He gathered everybody together and said, so when's our next action? Who's making the phone calls? Who's making the flyers? Always organizing, always keeping on. Keep on keeping on. Kadima, we say in Hebrew, always moving forward. I want to say also a, a gratitude to you, Teresa, and to Blaze for raising Colleen and Blaze to be such incredible human beings. A gift you've given to the world and them and to all the kindness and love they've shown so many of us here. In the Jewish tradition, when someone dies, we say, Zichron Lavracha, may his memory be for a blessing. It's active, not passive. We, with our actions and our words, we have to make someone's memory a blessing. There is no doubt what we can do to make the memory of Blaise Bompain a blessing. We stand up, we lift our voices, and we do so with great love in our hearts, great joy in our song, and compassion for every being. Zichrona Lavracha, may his memory be for a blessing. And next, we have the Reverend Janet McKeithen. Good afternoon. I'm the minister at the church in Ocean Park, one of the many places that Teresa and Blaze call home, and we call them a part of us. We're so honored to have that. And I'm honored to be here. I'm honored to be part of their extended, 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 widely family. I'm so honored to be a part of that. So thank you. Um, uh, in 2014, five years ago, the Church in Ocean Park honored Blaze and Teresa with the Communitas Award. And I want to share some of what he shared at that time because his words are so potent. After he, he began by thanking the church, and of course, and then he said, he went on to say, I want to express my gratitude also to you, Teresa. You have made communitas possible in our lives. And you have done that by your courage and your compassion. Aristotle thought that courage was the most essential virtue because without it, we can't do anything. Thank you for your courage, he was saying to Teresa, your compassion and your ever-present love and kindness. A perpetual war system makes communitas impossible, but there is hope. There is hope that we can end the war system and build a peace system. This was five years ago. I think we are getting a handle on it. How? By demonstrating that this tiny spaceship Earth is in grave danger from a war system and from the toxicity that is choking off the possibility of continuing life. We can change all of this by performing a marriage right here in this church. As the bride, we have the great environmental movement of the planet. As the groom, we have the people who work for peace. And the joining of these two great movements will give birth to the children of God, a world of communitas, which will transcend the nation state together with all ethnic, religious, and racial ignorance. What does that great Latin word mean? It actually means joint ownership of the planet. It actually means partnership with the flora and the fauna. It actually means fellowship. And it actually means kinship. Yes, one human family. As Ray Bradbury said, we are all together on a rock going around the sun. We should be holding hands. May peace be with us all. Some of you have, we've been talking a little bit today about a lot of things that happened in the past with Blaze and Teresa. But just a year and a half ago or less, the week before the neo-Nazis went to Charlottesville, they came to Virginia Avenue Park. 
and the Committee for Racial Justice. And Blaze and Teresa were there. Blaze was with his cane, and he normally walked slowly, you know, and he, but he was there, and there, outside was the neo-Nazis, and, and they were trying to cause havoc, and then they were trying to get in. They were trying to get into where our building was. And so they were bounding on the door, and they were pushing on it and pulling on it, and they opened it a little bit. And so somebody from the outside said, men, we need help, men, help. We need help over here, come on. And Blaze immediately got up. He didn't even think twice. And he got with his cane and running with his cane over to the door to help us. Immediately he got up. He was a comrade. He was more than an ally. He was a comrade in the struggle. There's no question that he knew that his liberation was tied to the liberation of other people. There was no separation between people in the struggle and people and the struggle. He understood that no one is free until all people are free. The blood in his veins ran in the blood of others' veins. I'll close with the United Methodist prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, we praise you for the great company of all those who have finished their course in faith and now rest from their labor. We praise you for those dear to us who we name in our hearts, especially we praise you this day for Blaze, whom you graciously have received into your presence. To all these, grant your peace. Let your perpetual light shine upon them and help us so to believe where we have not seen that your presence may lead us through our years and bring us at last with blaze into the joy of your home, not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens. Amen. And let's remember with blaze, we're all together on a rock going around the sun. We should be holding hands. May peace be with us all. Now we have a comment from my dear cousin, Katie Sample. Please come forward. Good afternoon. A brief introduction. I am Kate Colleen Sample. My parents are Jack and Patty Colleen. My dad, Jack, is Aunt Teresa's favorite brother on the West Coast. If my father were alive, he would most assuredly be here at this podium and not me. But as others have said, I am honored, and it, the honor is unearned, but I'm gonna do my best to honor Uncle Blaze. I kind of feel like the little drummer boy. What gift can I give such beautiful, eloquent speakers today? It's a bit intimidating. Um, I don't know about any of the other speakers, but I have been in a superlative and adjective crisis since I first was asked to speak. Where does one find the words to even begin to do justice to such a precious, precious man as Uncle Blaze? I actually had a few clever drafts written, but it just didn't feel right. And then I asked myself, as, as Blaze did, you know, what would Uncle Blaze want me to say? And then it occurred to me, cabbage salad. <laughs> that was the metaphor that I was looking for. My Uncle Blaze is famous for his cabbage salads. And he loved making them on site. And whenever we would have family get-togethers, Aunt Teresa would call and say, you know, what can we bring? We would always say, you know, please have Blaze bring his cabbage salad. And he liked to make it on site. And there was never a recipe. He would usually come with a head of cabbage, and then he would use whatever the host had on hand. And he loved to just stand in the kitchen with all the chaos going on and make his cabbage salad. And he would be, you know, conversing and talking and making his salad. And we would say, well, you know, what do you want to put in it, Uncle Blaze? Well, what, you know, what have you got? And I would say, well, some lemon juice? Lovely, he'd say. Zucchini? Of course. Olive oil or mayonnaise? Well, both, of course. He was joyously inclusive in the way that he made his cabbage salad. 
And he didn't care about the vessel that he put it in. He would just set it out onto the table with you know, a myriad of other meals. And the meal that was always eaten to the last spoonful was Blaze's cabbage salad. And it just made me think about what would he want to hear from my family's perspective? You know, what would he really enjoy uh, sharing and having shared about him and his life? Blaze became Uncle Blaze on January, on January 1st, 1970, and uh, my siblings and I were fortunate to uh, be at the wedding. I will never forget one of the first impressions that I have of Uncle Blaze is his size. You know, we're a small Irish clan. Not, we don't have anybody, I don't think, above 5'6", five, 5'7", five, in the family. So Uncle Blaze always towered in, in a room. His presence was just physical. And yet he was so soft and approachable and warm and genuine. The other thing that I recall as a young girl is Uncle Blaze's resonant voice. At their wedding, Blaze led an a cappella song of Let Us Break Bread Together. And he started singing it, and then Teresa joined in, and many of their friends joined in. And I kind of thought it was weird, but, <laughs> but at the same time, I mean, his voice was just lilting. It was just, just beautiful. And that was one of the gifts that he, he was very generous with um, when we would get together um, with, you know, at family events. The Bonpains and the Colleens spent many holidays and family vacations together. And, I hope to do many more, of course. My parents held him and Teresa in such high esteem. And that translated, of course, to us children as we got older. We didn't really know a whole lot about, you know, what Blaze and Teresa did when we were young. We just kind of heard come some radical stories and salacious details and, you know, we, did, we really didn't know. But as we grew up, we started realizing, my goodness, these people live a very unusual life. I often wondered, why did Blaze and Teresa choose voluntarily to spend so many holidays with our family? I mean, they have oodles of, of accomplished friends and lovely people that they could spend time with, but time and again, they would, drove, they would drive the Southern California freeways hours and hours on holidays to be with us. I often thought that Colleen and Blazer were, felt like you know, adolescent hostages, that they had to come and see their weird, loud cousins again. But whatever the holiday, the Bompains arrived in their sticker-covered Volvo <laughs> with sincere hugs and smiles for everyone. They made a point of greeting every person there. And you know, we're a large clan, so 20, 30, 40 people sometimes. When they would get through with all the hellos, it was almost time to say goodbye. But we, we loved it. We loved our time together. I believe the greatest gift that we can give to one another, other than love, is our time. It's unknowable, and it's finite. Today, as I reflect on Uncle Blaze's impact on our family's lives, the time that he and Teresa and the kids shared with us is so precious. At these family events, we always counted on Uncle Blaze's cabbage salad, of course, and they would give us an update on the significant social injustices that were going on in the world. And Aunt Teresa would always remind us about who we were supposed to be boycotting at any given time. <laughs> My mother took these recommendations very seriously and I don't know how many years we went without eating grapes in our family but you know I remember grapes were a no-no for a long time. Throughout the 70s and 80s Uncle Blaze had by then had made his now famous appearance on Wooly George. He had worked alongside Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta. He ran for political offices. He'd been arrested enough times that when he appeared on the evening news it wasn't that big of a deal anymore. Aunt Teresa did a good job, though. She would usually try to call my dad and say, you know, Jack, Blaze got arrested again, and just so you know, you know, you might see it on the news. She was pretty consistent with those phone calls when she wasn't in the tank with him. <laughs> <laughs> of 
We were so blessed to have the downtime with Blaze and Teresa and our cousins. One trip in particular is worth sharing the details because it cements Uncle Blaze's superhero celebrity status in our family. It was around 1975, and Teresa and Blaze joined us at our very humble vacation getaway in Ensenada, Mexico, emphasis on the humble. My sister, Alicia, who was 15 or 16, had received and brought with her a sealed love letter from her new boyfriend, Mark, who became her husband of 46 years. She wanted to read it in private, so she launched our family's little fiberglass skiff into the bay. Somehow, she lost an oarlock and found herself caught in a current that was dragging her towards a hazardous jetty at the far end of the bay. Well, thankfully, some of the locals on the beach recognized that it was Alicia, and they came running up to our little trailer where Blaze and Teresa and my mom and dad were out sunning on the patio, and they were shouting in Spanish, you know, that my sister was in trouble. Well, thank goodness, you know, Uncle Blaze spoke Spanish. He immediately recognized the danger in the situation, and um, again, you know, without hesitation, he just stood up and started running down the dirt road towards the beach. Well, to get down to the beach, you had to you had to make your way down this uh, eroded dirt and rock cliff, practically. Um, and Uncle Blaze just scaled it like it was nothing. And then, to get to the dangerous part of the jetty where my sister's boat was heading, he also had to traverse over these loose, like, batard-sized rocks that had formed a, an angled berm. They were ankle breakers, let me tell you. Again, we don't know how he did it, but he flew over those rocks made his way out onto the jetty, these slippery, jagged rocks, in record time. He, he must have been a half a mile long that he, he uh, ran. And just as my sister's boat had reached the tip of, the, of this jetty, and the big waves were coming and crashing up, Uncle Blaze, with one of his big bare arms, you know, just reached down and grabbed her as the boat just was lifted up over on, and fell onto the rocks. And he saved my sister Alicia's life. And I will never forget that. It turns out she's actually one of the best of us, so he, he, he chose well. <laughs> Poor Uncle Blaze lost his glasses. He lost his watch. My sister lost a lot of pride, I think. But to arrive just in time to save her life is, is family lore. Now, I don't think he was wearing angel wings or a cape, but in my version of this memory, he definitely was. Uncle Blaze often gifted us with a song or two at our gatherings, I'll usually following one of Aunt Teresa's Irish pub songs. But my favorite, hands down, was Juan Tarameda. And um, I heard that it was being uh, rehearsed a little bit earlier, so I hope that this isn't too redundant. But there's a particular lyric that I'd like to share with you in honor of Uncle Blaze. Join me if you know the words. Just, a, just one little... Little verse. Yo soy un hombre sincero, de donde crece la palma. Yo soy un hombre sincero, de donde crece la palma. Y antes de morir me quiero echar mis versos de la alma. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Uncle Blaze's genuine love of humanity and his consistent expression of that love in whatever form is his greatest gift to me and to my family. And it be he became larger than life as we became adults and understood the context of what a special man he is. Selfishly, I hoped that Uncle Blaze would always be here as a grounding factor in our lives. Without him in the world, it feels a little less secure. When we got the news that he had passed, I, I just kept thinking in, in a game of, of tug of war, Uncle Blaze was a stronghold on the, on the good guy's side. And I felt like we lost a true powerhouse. But no writing about Uncle Blaze should ever conclude on a, on a sorrowful note. He insisted on living in joy, finding joy, giving and receiving joy 
in every situation. While I have many more fond memories I could share, I conclude my sharing, acknowledging the joy that he has brought our family for almost 50 years. He taught for us by modeling for us compassion, acceptance, fairness, reason, sacrifice, deed, resistance, unrelenting effort, and above all love. With all my heart, I love you, Aunt Teresa. I love you, Colleen. I love you, Blaze, all your children. And may we just continue to love each other the way that we always have. Thank you.